Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, so I'm Andrew Lewis. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a personal project I've been working on for the last uh, little while. Um, it's called uh, Memex, and I'm going to explain what that is and go over uh, the historical version and my version. Um, so I'm going to start with some history. Usually we don't have too much history at tech conferences, and if it's history, it's about you know, how the last technique from a year ago is like outdated. That's history. I'm going to talk about the kind with black and white photos, and it's really old. We're going to start in the 1930s, uh, and the character we're talking about is Vannevar Bush. So he was, uh, this is a picture of him here. Uh, he was an inventor and engineer at MIT. Uh, he built some of the first analog computers. So these were really cool, large mechanical devices, and they would do math problems, more or less. Uh, usually calculus, that was a hard thing to do uh, otherwise. Um, and he built some of the, some of the largest first computers, uh, and they were really cool. Uh, he worked uh, out of MIT, as I said. Um, this is an example of one of the machines uh, so what it's doing, the operator on the right is actually tracing the curve uh, of a graph, and then the integral uh, is, be is being calculated. So really cool devices. So in the 1940s, everything shifted in American science uh, because uh, World War II happened. So everything reoriented. Uh, people were pressed into the war effort. Um, and in the home front, uh, there was also an explosion of information, and, and this was being used to support the war effort. So new, new bureaucracy sprung up, new processes, new information was being produced. Uh, so, so just like going through the photos from this time, it's pretty cool just to visualize how much new information and reports were coming out. Uh, just rooms of, uh, of people just like creating information. Uh, and Vannevar Bush had a problem. His job during the war was to interpret reports, science, scientific reports, and make recommendations to the president. So every day his desk would be flooded with uh, things to read, things to understand, uh, and he was just buried under, under information. Um, so he had a phrase, he says, we're being buried under our, our own product. So technology was allowing us to create information uh, more than ever before, but we didn't have tools to make sense of it or understand it. Um, so when the war wrapped up, he put his engineering hat back on, and he published a, 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 an essay that would uh, create a device that would solve all these problems. It was called As We May Think. It was from 1945. And he came up with this uh, device called the Memex. Uh, so here's an illustration of it, a uh, pretty simple so desk-sized device, uh, screens on the top and microfilm inside. Um, and, and the Memex, he said, is a device that an individual stores all their books, records, and communications, uh, and then you can search through it, navigate it, um, and this is really cool. Like, it would just be the one place where your personal information would be, would be stored in. Um, it would have this cool stylus for adding notes and uh, drawings into it, uh, this voice recorder so that you could add voice memos into your, into your Memex, uh, even this clip-on camera uh, that you can add photos into your Memex, and you know, <laughs> don't know, it's a little bit like science fiction, but um, this was you know, the idea he had. Um, but the reason that we're talking about the memex still to this day is this idea that he had. So Vannevar Bush identified that when we're looking for information in our brain, we don't go through an alphabetical index, we don't go through a categorical index. We navigate almost like a graph, so we think about who we were with or wh where we were or what we were doing at the same time. Uh, and he said that the memex could do this mechanically. Um, so if you imagine these are nodes in the memex's data set, um, as the user would navigate through their data, uh, the trails between the nodes would be recorded. Uh, and then later on, as the user wants to search for something, they can use these trails to find something uh, by association again. So the unfortunate thing about the Memex was that it was never built. Uh, it was a conceptual device. It was just an essay. Um, and uh, yeah, it was never built. Uh, this was very unfortunate. Um, so it uh, made me sad. Um, I'll just talk about it a little bit about myself. Um, I'm in the information pack rack. Um, if there's a piece of information that I've generated or seen or created about myself, uh, I like to store it. Um, so this is my journal from grade five. Uh, you know, I started doing that um, and haven't really stopped since then. Um, my report cards that I've kept, this is from kindergarten. Um, this is my movie stubs that I've saved a record of, uh, each one of them. Um, this is a map I tried to do, uh, recording my walks through the city. This was before Google Maps. Uh, I just wanted to have a sense of where I was walking in the city. Um, even my chat logs from high school I saved, and if you read this carefully, like, they're really not worth preserving, but I thought it might be fun to save them. <laughs> uh, not the deepest conversation. Um, but uh, in this kind of new era, this new digital era, we have more information than ever before, uh, and I'm being inundated with personal history. Um, like, it's too much to archive. Uh, and it's just an overwhelming problem for me. Uh, like, I have, I have, I'm generating more than ever, and it's harder and harder to track. Um, so a while ago, I was thinking about this. I think the most obvious uh, solution uh, would be maybe to talk to a therapist. <laughs> this, is, this is not what I did. Um, instead, I used Ruby. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I decided to build my own Memex, and this was, a, this was a way to solve this kind of personal archiving problem. 
Um, so the first thing I did was just going about gathering data. Um, so first of all, it's a lot of my reading and browsing history. So from my RSS reader or my browser or my ebook reader, I save uh, records of what I read or consume. Um, my digital consumptions, like uh, you know, the things I like on Twitter or the videos I watch, uh, music podcasts, I have records of these and I have importers. Um, my location history from my GPS device in my pocket, um, it's always, always recording me. Um, and then my messaging and social interactions like email, Slack, and, and then a lot of stuff like uh, qualitative data, like journaling that I mentioned before, or just annotations I take or notes that I make. Um, so I have all this like large data set um, and I've kind of put it into a single place. Um, I'm gonna do a live demo now. Last night I had a, a nightmare uh, that uh, my demo didn't work and then everybody was filing out. Uh, so this is my nightmare. If this happens, maybe just like trick tech Twitter instead of walking out and uh, <laughs> I'll make it bad. So I'm gonna do the live demo now. Cool, so this is, um, is that, people can read, is that okay? Yeah, cool. Okay, so this is the basic screen. What we have at the top is a query, an active query. Then we have the results uh, being displayed on the timeline and we have an idea of uh, results over time on the left. Um, so what we're seeing now is a, is a query for everything I've done on GitHub. And you can see like it's a range of information, like it's a ticket I created or, uh, what I can do now is add um, a, another a verb, so verb like, so this is everything on GitHub that I've liked. Um, so this is the repositories I've liked. Um, just to give an idea of the graph structure that I'm using for my system, uh, we can turn on this visualizer here. Um, so everything's from the pr perspective of myself, so I'm in the middle, this is the Andrew Lewis node. Uh, this is a, a repository that I've liked, and these are the tags that are associated with it. So in this case, Electron has been shared by a few repositories that I've liked. So I can use this um, navigational, uh, I can use this graph structure to navigate through my personal history. So if, for instance, I wanna find uh, everything uh, electron base that I've liked on GitHub, I can do something like this. Um, um, so I'm doing a traversal, finding electron, then finding repositories that uh, it's about, and then times I've liked that. So I execute this query. Um, and yeah, so these are the repositories uh, about electron that I've liked on GitHub. Um, and I can use this technique for all kinds of things, like I can find um, my listening histi history. Um, and I'm doing a traversal now, I wanna find songs. Uh, where the creators are Aretha Frank Franklin. Um, so now this is um, gonna be a query for every song that I've listened to uh, that was created by Aretha Franklin. Um, and then I can add other conditions, so for instance, love. So now we're adding a full text search. Um, so this is every song uh, that matches love by Aretha Franklin that I've listened to. Um, so you can get a, kind of get a sense of how I can use this information to navigate through my personal history. I can also do pretty open-ended queries, so um, something pretty simple like just searching for Ruby, like what's everything in my system um, matching Ruby? Um, so you know, it's, it's a combination, this is like a tweet that I've liked, this is some browser history. Um, if you're wondering about why the photos are there, it's because I have OCR on every photo that I have, so, um, so if I add the photograph tag, um, you can get an idea of like photos that, um, where, where it's matched Ruby, so I can, I can um, always be able, I can always search my personal history through even just imagery. Um, this is pretty useful for even like tweets that have a lot of text. I can search all these. Um, so to, to do um, something similar, I can do verb messaged. So this is every message that I've sent or received uh, that matches Ruby. Um, Right, so you know, it's, it's from a range of sources, this is email. It's fun to go back in my personal history and go back, uh, this is 2005 now, and see like some of the early thoughts, you know, the, the early discoveries about Ruby, Ruby on Rails. Um, and it, you know, it just kind of gives a sense of like where I was at at the time. I forgot like how difficult I found Rails at the time. And you know, it's, it's, it's something you forget, but like this lets me almost like zoom back in my, in my time and, and understand it. Uh, this is the first mention of Ruby. I don't think it's about Ruby the language. Uh, I think it was a high school uh, chemistry test. Um, but it's fun to be able to navigate my personal history that way. Um, perhaps more usefully for developers, I have um, uh, my, my, uh, my bash commands. Uh, so uh, this is like everything I've done on the command line, um, which I think a lot of people have through bash history. But um, the cool thing I can do, like beyond searching, I mean this is still, you can do this with, um, with your bash history. Like I can do a search for a, a, a tool. But the cool thing about, the, like, about my system is that I have a lot of different information and it's all collated by time. So uh, gifsicle is a command I use every now and then to create animated gifs. I always forget the order of the flags. Um, so what I can do is uh, go back in time, find the time I used it, and then kind of see what else I was doing at the time. So, um, in this case, I was looking at some Stack Overflow history, and just being able to see like different things in, on the same timeline and in, in, in the context is really powerful for um, like understanding where I was at, understanding how I came to an idea or how I learned something. 
Um, so a lot of the original Memex was about reading. Um, so I have my full reading history. So just to do the broad query, this is um, you know all the books I've read. Um, so um, you know like a lot of people uh, see the amount of data I have and they want to do kind of quantified self stuff. So I, I mean I have that kind of data. So this is a graph of like my reading history over time. Um, I can do silly things like my reading time by hit, by hour. So like this is like the hours of the day that I read. Um, I can also do you know, silly things like uh, correlation. So uh, does reading increase my mood? Um, you know, I can kind of maybe derive some sort of answer about this. Like maybe if I read more, uh, you know, my mood goes up. Um, but honestly, like the more I do this sort of query, the, the less interested I am in this data. And I think really the, the really powerful thing for me is just the context and being able to see like where I came to something. So in this case, like I mean, like let's see this reading session. I can go back and see the context of that day. So I was at home, I was with my partner, it was a four degree day, which is Celsius. Um, and then I can also see like what I was doing in that reading session. So, um, uh, so I can just see like the quotes that I saved, I can see the browser history I did while reading that book. And you know, if I ever come across this link, for instance, I can always go back and see like where I came from it. So in this case, I came while reading a book and that's pretty powerful for understanding uh, personal history. So that's just like a rough idea of the, of the system I put together. I'm gonna to do some more queries at the end, but I'm gonna go back to uh, the slides for now. So it worked, I'm glad about that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, something's freezing here. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm just gonna give a rough overview. So um, I wasn't showing it here, but I have the whole app running in an Electron app, and that holds both the interface that you saw and then the importers uh, that run and collect data. Um, and then those talk to an API. There's basically two endpoints. There's one read endpoint that, does all the, that handles all the queries that I do, the, the subgraph uh, queries. And then there's a separate endpoint for the writing, and generally the importers have write-only access, and they use a single endpoint to just like hammer the API with uh, personal history that it's, that it's being imported. Um, and this talks to a really fancy graph database that I, I discovered, it's called Postgres. Um, so <laughs> I kind of explored other, other ways of doing this, but like honestly Post, Postgres is rock solid and uh, there's a node, a node table and a relationship table and all the graphs are kind of generated from these very simple queries and Postgres is amazing at doing this. It's amazing for full text search, it's amazing for geo, geolocation. Um, so I've just settled on this and it really works well. Um, so the API is in Rails, uh, the interface is in Ember.js. Uh, the desktop app is in Electron, and then uh, the importer is all in Ruby. So I'm gonna focus on this for, for a bit. Um, so uh, the importers are set up as an ETL system. So ETL stands for extract, transform, load. So first we extract from a source. This could be a scraper, this could be an API importer. Uh, it could be uh, you know, a, a big zip file of data. Then we, tra then we, oh, yeah, I don't know what the transition is. So we transform it. Oh, I don't know what's going on. Okay, so we extract it, we transform it, which is uh, changing that uh, data, uh, that piece of data into the schema that I, uh, that I control, and then we load it into the API. Um, so I wanna focus on this, the data problem that I have. Like, I think, uh, you know, you look at this system and you think the interface was the hard part or the API was the hard part. Like, every, like really nothing compares to how much difficulty I've had in just trying to acquire my personal data. Um, and every time I'm finished, something will break or something will not work, and I have to go back and spend more time on it. So there's a bunch of problems. Um, something is going wrong. Yeah, so I mean, the, the main problem is that there, there might not be an API for something I'm trying to do, um, and this is often the case. For example, Kindle. Um, you know, you read on your Kindle device and you save quotes or you have a reading session, and there's no API for Kindle. So what people typically do and what I had to do was scrape this, this page, and it's pretty awful stuff. Um, that's really the only way to get this data. Um, even if there's an API, it's not one that might be designed for me to use. So a lot of these things are you know, private APIs that I have to somehow uh, reverse engineer or understand. Um, this is an example, this is my iMessage history. Um, so iMessage syncs to the hard drive and then I can read it off an SQLite database. But I have to you know, kind of make sense of this horrible schema and make, make sense of like, where, where my message is and like, how to get the timestamp. And it's a lot of reverse engineering, it's quite difficult and it changes a lot. Um, this is another example. Even if there's a public API, it might not be a good one. Um, does anybody work for Twitter here in the room? Shoo, 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Some hands half up. Okay, so the Twitter API is, uh, is really challenging, I think, to integrate with. Uh, there's a lot of inconsistencies. I'm going to focus on one in particular, the favorite. So when I favorite something on Twitter, uh, I, um, I want a record of it because it's pretty nice to be able to search it. Um, the favorites endpoint is sorted by the publish time. So if I favorite something from three years ago, that's going to be like hundreds of pages back in history, and there's pretty much no way that I can notice that new uh, favorite unless I, I page back every single time. Uh, and there's no timestamps of when I've liked something, so to build an accurate, uh, accurate timeline of the things I've liked, I really have to pull this endpoint every three or four minutes and then page back 100 pages. Uh, so it's, it's quite challenging to actually you know, get my data in a good format this way. Uh, this is just like a forum post uh, you know, where people vent about this. Um, does anybody work for Fitbit in this room? Okay, <laughs> no. I mean, Fitbit's a great, I have a Fitbit, you know, it works really nicely, it takes my heartbeats, it records my sleep, which is really important for my timelines. Um, if you squint closely, you might notice something that's missing from these timestamps. Uh, does anybody see what's missing? I'm gonna yell it out. It's a, so it's missing a time zone. Um, so the Fitbit time is actually local to, uh, local to the device. So I came from Eastern time, and as I crossed into Pacific time, now all my timestamps don't have a record of, uh, you know, like they're, they're now based on Pacific time, and I have, no, I have no record of when I switch time zones. So this data set is almost worse than use, useless because it's gonna, if I'm gonna build a timeline, I'm gonna put that sleep record like in the middle of my you know, browsing history. So it's, it's, almost, it's almost useless in a sense. Um, so yeah, like this is another forum post where people are venting about, uh, about you know, the lack of time zones. Um, even if there's a good API for what I'm trying to do, it might not last forever. And this is something I've been noticing more and more over, over uh, the time I've been working on this project. Um, so here's, here's an example. Instagram used to have a pretty good API, and you could go in and look at your, uh, your, your photos you published or the photos that you've liked. Uh, but then suddenly with the Cambridge Analytical scandal, they kind of freaked out and they just deprecated their API, like if you look closely immediately. So there's almost like no advanced warning on this. Uh, and it really like caught a lot of developers off guard. And like as of now, there's really no way that I can get my Instagram history uh, into my system. Um, another example is YouTube. So YouTube has a pretty good API. I used to be able to pull my, uh, my watching history uh, from like of which videos I've watched on YouTube, and this is a really nice source of data for searching later on. Uh, they removed their, their history endpoint, so I can no longer see this. And they never really explained why, they just sort of silently removed it. It caught a lot of people off guard as well. Um, and here's an example of a forum post where people are venting about it. You know, someone kind of calls them out on what their mission is and you know, asks them if they forget, forgot about this. And like, Google hasn't really said why they removed their, their, um, the viewing history. And this is a big problem for me because I really want this, this data. Um, so if you're thinking GDPR has solved this, GDPR is the new privacy regulations that are coming out of Europe. Uh, and one of the stipulations is that you need to have a user, uh, users should be able to export their data in a machine readable format. So in theory, this is great for me. A lot of services have added um, export features, like Facebook, Instagram now has an export. But the problem is that these export formats are not really great. Like they're not good for me as a user, they're not really good for, uh, sorry, they're, not, they're not good for me as a, as a human just to read the export, and they're not really good for machines to parse. So here's an example. Um, this is my Facebook messaging history. Uh, so in May, uh, I would download that big zip file that you get, and you get a big JSON uh, file of the messages. Uh, so this is how they represented the participants in a messaging uh, thread. Uh, in September, uh, this is what they did. They just kind of changed the structure uh, into a different sort of object. And there was no documentation or warning uh, about this export change. Uh, like, I mean, it's really not designed for uh, the kind of thing I'm trying to do. So, I mean, they're not gonna notify you know, the change, but it really makes my importers fragile because I have to always watch out for errors and then try to correct them really quickly. Um, so, and another thing they did is they added 1,000 millisecond precision timestamps. And again, like, this just broke my importers one day, and I had no idea why, and I had to kind of figure it out and then um, add that change. So, I, 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 I ask myself this all the time. Am I doing something that just shouldn't be done? Like, uh, you know, sort of an uphill battle. I'm trying to collect my personal information and bring it into one place, but I really feel like, you know, the tech world has not made this easy for me. And, uh, this is not something I should be doing, it seems like, it's, you know, it's not really encouraged. Um, and I, I, I ask myself this all the time. Um, but I think I, I take a little bit of comfort from the first mimics, because I think it did a lot of things wrong itself back in 1945. So the first thing that it did wrong was computers were supposed to be big. So this is a, this is a computer here you're looking at. Um, if you think the little things that people are using are the computers, that's, that's not the computer. The computer is the room of people. Uh, there are computers. If you look at the label, it's a, it's a computing division. Um, so computers were, you know, large size. They were either humans doing calculations. Uh, you know, even later on, this is a hard drive. Um, computers are large. Um, 
The, the Memex, on the other hand, was like this desk size device. This is like a mock-up of what it might have looked like. It's not, you know, real Memex, but someone uh, put together, uh, you know, a, a, um, a version of it that what it might have looked like. So it's a desk size, single user uh, system. So it was smaller than computers were supposed to be in the 1940s. Um, another thing was uh, the Memex was uh, solving, uh, you know, it had the wrong audience. Computers were for institutions, for corporations, for big groups that had money. Um, so this is an example of one of Vannevar Bush's uh, early analog computers, and it was being used, uh, you know, by MIT. This was MIT's analog computer, um, or you know, like corporations had large mainframes. This is what computers were supposed to be for. And then uh, I think this is the most important. Um, computers were used for hard, important problems. You know, like you know, world-changing uh, problems for institutions. Uh, the Memex, on the other hand, was just solving a pretty simple, like personal problem. It's like how do we stay on top of information overload? Um, so computers. Uh, we're, we're, you know, this is uh, Bletchley Park, uh, and it was being used for uh, cracking Nazi code, so, you know, hard, important problem. Uh, this is a computer being used for doing ballistic calculations. That it was called the ENIAC, the, one of the first digital computers. Uh, this is the UNIVAC doing sense, uh, recording the census. So computers were used for these big, hard problems. Um, but yeah, the Memex was like this single user device that was just there to help people understand their personal history and their, uh, you know, search and navigate it and make sense of it. And I think the phrase that rolls around in my head is uh, a machine for the mind. So like, this was not a, a you know, computer for doing a, a payroll calculations, stuff like that. It was a machine for understanding our own minds. And this was like the really unique thing about the Memex and like the reason we're still talking about it now. It created this thread of um, almost yearning for personal devices that would help us and, and be able to use technology to help and empower individuals. Um, and I think as Rubyists, like, you know, uh, a lot of the jobs that are available to us are, you know, working for advertising or working for, you know, creating surveillance systems or uh, there's a lot of things that we can use our power for. Um, I'd like to challenge us all to maybe think about how we can use Ruby to, you know, just help us to maybe expand on some of the dreams that we had 50 years ago or um, really make, uh, make our, our brains better or make sense of the world. Um, so I'm going to do um, another, another demo now. Uh, so was anybody at Keep Ruby Weird on Friday? Cool, a few hands. So that was, uh, that was last Friday in Austin. Um, this, is, uh, this started on Tuesday in LA. So a few friends and I were, were, were going to be at both, and you know, we got to thinking, um, you know, wouldn't it be a bad idea to drive in between? So uh, we looked it up on Google, 20-hour um, drive. That's a lot of driving. I always love when Google suggests that you're doing something wrong by uh, telling you to fly instead. <laughs> but yeah, we decided, we, decided we, we had a little bit of time, so we'd drive in between. Um, so I'll just go over some of the queries I can do, like based on the road trip and like how the Memex, I, the, uh, how I use it in my own life, and like kind of like what it's enabled me to do. Um, so I'm going to switch back to my demo now. Um, so Keep Ruby Weird was a conference in Austin. Uh, it was it took place in the um, Alamo Draft House. So as I'm sitting there listening to talks, um, I might look up stuff, and uh, that's a you know pretty good. I might remember it, remember it in two years and want to find that thing I was uh, listening to about. So I can do something like this. So verb browsed, and it occurred um, within the Ala, Alamo Draft House. So um, this is all my browser history uh, that you know I, I did while sitting in that room. Um, I can do, I can make it more specific. I might have remembered that I, I looked up a Wikipedia article based on a talk. Uh, I might not remember anything else about what that talk was about or what the context was, but I remember that I looked up a Wikipedia article in the Alma Draft House. So because of the way of my data set, I have, I have a way to find this. So in this case, it was a, a really cool talk that you should all watch the video of, uh, but I looked up what a quine was. Um, so the graph system I have based on my personal history lets me, allows me to navigate my own personal history in all kinds of different ways. Um, so as I said, we decided to drive between Austin and LA. Um, so let me, let me just pull it up, um, kind of like the overall record. So the verb I use is traveled. Um, the instrument is the automobile. There's a lot of like clumsy language, but um, bear with it. Um, and I went with my, my friends Phil and Max. So, um, so I can do occurred with Max, Phil. Um, so now this is all of the uh, automobile trips I did with Phil and Max. And I can plot it on a map. Um, and just to kind of load the full trip. Yeah, so this is the route we took. Um, so I have this history available, this, you know, this timeline of our drive. Um, but I, I can use it to do all kinds of things, like uh, you know, look up the photos that we took along the way. So um, we photographed. And um, it occurred during an automobile ride. So this is every photo I took while driving with my friends, uh, Max and Phil. Um, and it should load. Yeah, so these are like the photos I took. 
Um, and again, because of the OCR, um, as we were crossing into California, the time zones changed. Programmers like time zones. And I might make a joke about it, and I want to look up that photo I took of the sign where the time zone changed. So I can, uh, I can use the OCR to just do like a, you know, kind of like a shot in the dark here. I'm looking for photographs that involve time zone while driving with my friends Phil and Max. Um, and this should load it. Yeah, so this is the photo of the, t the, of the sign when you cross into the time zones. And it lets me find this kind of stuff pretty easily. Um, another thing is like, you know, I arrive here and people ask, oh, did you eat anything cool along the way? So I can do, um, I can do a search for, um, so I want to stay with my friends Phil and Max because I was with them the whole weekend. Uh, and then I'm going to find visited. So these are the places I visited. But I want to scope it down to um, um, activities during. And uh, so what we're doing here is finding places where inside that act, uh, visit I ate something. Um, so this pulls up all the restaurants I ate uh, while with Max and Phil. Um, it kind of gets the sense of like, uh, where I was. And then for each one of these things, I can always load more context and, and see like, what that day was like. So again here, Phil and Max uh, come up. Uh, it was a you know, 22 Celsius day. Um, and then I can look within that and see you know, what, what, what did I actually eat at the ski in. So I, had, I drank water. I had a burger. Uh, here are the photos we took. Um, here's me looking up, like we were like directly on top of the San Andreas Fault, so like I have a record of like me searching for that and being a bit worried about it, um, and just like like it gives a sense of like what I was doing, and it's, it's a fun way to navigate my personal history. Um, and so while we were in there, the, the, the restaurant has like this uh, wall of uh, dollar bills where people leave messages. And let's say I couldn't remember the restaurant name, uh, and I couldn't remember um, you know, what trip it was on. I can find photos of these dollar bills that we left in a totally different way. I can just do something like um, verb photograph. Um, I'm still with my friends Phil and Max, and then I want to do um, involved about money. So I have uh, image classification going on my photos. So I can do something like this. And it should pull up the three photos. I'm not sure what I typed wrong. But yeah, it, it would pull up the photos of, the, of, the, of the us leaving the money on the wall. Um, so we arrived in LA. Um, let me put on the map again. So um, this is our driving again. And as we're driving into LA, um, I'm like, Oh, this looks familiar. I'm pretty sure I've driven on this stretch of LA before. So I can look at the trail that we took into the city um, and just use it to search, like, what, when was I around this location again? So what I've done is I, I researched for uh, traveling history. And if I zoom out, I can see, like, other trips I took on, you know, in 2016 I was here. And I drove on that stretch of highway before. And I can kind of confirm that I've seen it before. Um, and it's really fun for just, like, you know, having that intuition of, like, what, if you've seen something before. Another thing similarly is uh, on Tuesday, has, did anybody go to the Broad Gallery? It's up the street. Uh, it's really cool. It's a, it's a new contemporary art gallery. Um, so I popped over there. You should all do it if you have a bit of time. Um, and as I'm walking through the art, um, I notice an artist, and, and her name seems familiar. So um, just one of the things I can do, and I do this a lot, is just search some, like, someone's name or a topic and just like, see what the broad history is. And, um, as I suspected, like these are the notes I took while I was in there, but I can also see, you know, her name was mentioned in an in a email newsletter that I got. Um, it was like also in my RSS reader. Uh, I looked up her Wikipedia article when I, was, uh, when I was liking a tweet. So it gives this incredible context. As I'm walking through the gallery, I can really pull up like what I've seen about a topic before. And um, it really helps me um, kind of be present and understand like my own history and then enjoy um, the present a lot more because I can fit it into this kind of like narrative that I have in my head about my, my personal history. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of like what I can do with, um, with my personal history. And, um, uh, one phrase that kind of rolls around in my head, this is also from Vannevar Bush. Um, so he said about his machine, as the human molds the machine, so the machine remolds the human mind. And I find myself doing this all the time um, because I have all this personal history in, in now. I use, I use this system all the time. And because I use it, I have a desire to add new features or to have different visualization or add a, a, you know, a, a new way to interact with the data. And that molds the machine. But you know, vice versa, like, as, I, as, as I add features, um, the machine kind of molds me as well. Like, I, I understand myself better. I navigate the world differently. Um, and you know, it's, it's a really nice symbiotic relationship, a really good uh, feedback loop that I, I find myself in. So if you're, is anybody, would anybody use something like this? Show of hands. OK, that's cool. I, I think people, people probably who didn't put up their hands are worried about privacy and like, security. That's also cool. Um, but yeah, if you are interested, uh, I do plan on launching some version of this in the future. Um, you can put your email address into this. Uh, I'd love to talk about it, or um, you know, send me an email if you have thoughts or ideas about this. Um, 
but yeah, like I, I do hope to launch this mostly as an open source project. I just want to figure out how I can uh, you know, receive some revenue for working on this. But yeah, th thanks for listening, and I'd love to take questions uh, if you have any. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so the question was, how does the system know what I ate? So in general, everything you saw in the demo was automated, like it was sources like my phone or browser history being pulled in automatically. There's a few categories that I still do, I, I manually tag, so that's my, like the friends I see, the eating that I do, and a few other things. So like, I, I have a really simple system for tagging, um, you know, I'll just, I'll record that I ate a burrito or I, you know, I ate pizza or something like that. So that's, that's manual. Like honestly, the eating and drinking records and that, that kind of stuff is like less useful. I, I, I think you could get a lot of value from the system without having that kind of stuff, but yeah, I, I do that manually. Yeah, cool, okay, so the first question was uh, like how often I use it. Um, I use it all the time, like I'm, I'm you know, in an art gallery and I'm searching all the time to see like the context or I, I meet someone, I, I'll just check like maybe they're a friend of a friend or I've seen their name in Twitter or something like that. So I use it all the time, like that's the main reason. Um, there's also kind of like introspection, like seeing uh, you know, what kind of things I'm reading that's different uh, from a year ago. So I, I use it for introspection. Uh, and then I guess the follow-up question is like, how has it changed me? Like, I think it's hard to point to one single thing, but like, it's, it's, I think of this almost like a journal. Like, journals are really good for understanding where you were in the past, how you've changed, like what you were stressed about that you're no longer stressed about. And I think like, you know, everybody should have a journal or, you know, some version of it. Like, it's really powerful. So I think what I have is like kind of like a supercharged version of that journal. And then the benefits I get are all the benefits that a journal would give you. So like, um, you know, like being able to read my history about my early first few years writing Ruby. I was really like, I didn't get it. I, I struggled with a lot of stuff. I was excited by it. But it's cool to read that now and then see like, the things that I'm not stressed about, or the things that I don't find hard, or the things I'm not anxious about. Um, so you really understand yourself that way. Um, there's a lot of practical things, like just being able to look up uh, commands that I ran, or things that I look up, looked up, um, that's really powerful, and I use that a lot, so. Yeah, yeah, totally. So the, yeah, the question is about like, um, th like are there kind of negative, um, negative habits that come out of, come out of the system? Um, I think most of my friends would say that I, you know, they don't really notice the fact that I'm like tagging things or searching too much, so I, I think that's good. Like, I try to kind of keep it, like, I don't tell people automatically what I'm working on, so like, I think I lead a pretty normal life, uh, except that I have this system available. Um, there are like definitely things, like, I'm always thinking, like, so when I, when I go from one restaurant to the bar next door or something like that, that's often not enough uh, space for my GPS to record that it's a new venue, so I have walked around the block uh, <laughs> in the past to like trigger uh, you know the, the timestamps of when I shifted venues. So like there's silly little things like that. I'm like pretty um, I'm pretty obsessive about having like really high quality data. So I will do things like that. Or um, when you open Twitter, when you click on a link in Twitter, it doesn't necessarily open in Safari, um, and and therefore I won't have a browser history. So often I'll just like open in Safari that I have uh, that I kind of manually trigger a history entry. So I have a lot of habits like this just to force the history to be recorded, but. I, I hope it hasn't really changed me too much. I, I, I've always been an introspective and kind of like nostalgic person, so this is like feeding into that. I don't know for better or worse, but like that's just who I am, so yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, so the question is about like habits and identifying them. Yeah, like I think there's a lot of like really simple things. Like I, I think one of the techniques around habit forming is being able to like do something for, I don't know, 30 days or whatever the, whatever the number is. And like for me, I can say, um, I can set up a dashboard and say like, uh, do I read every day? And I can, you know, mark that green square for every, every day and then build a habit around it. So it gives me, like, a powerful tool for creating habits uh, and also, like, a powerful tool for just understanding, like, what habits I might need to create. Um, and, like, it doesn't, like, if I don't want to change myself, then, um, you know, this thing isn't necessarily going to, like, force me to do it, but, like, it lets me, if I want to change myself or I am able to identify something I want to change, it, it's pretty easy to kind of set up a dashboard or set up a query to to look at that habit and then maybe figure out an action item out of it. So the question is, where does the code run? Um, so this, what you saw in the demo is all running off my local development version on my laptop. Um, what I have kind of like, what I'm playing around with is an Electron app that, you know, houses the interface and houses the importers. Uh, and then underneath it, the API can run in Docker or your own cloud instance, and I think that would be the model I would want to go towards. Like, what I absolutely don't want to do is have a system where, which aggregates personal information from everybody at the same time. Um, I don't want like a centralized version of this. Like, it just it's unethical, I think. Um, so yeah, like what I'm what I'm trying to what I think will make sense is like just an Electron desktop app um, with the database either on the hard drive or in a, in a personal cloud. Uh, and you know the data is just like kind of like like I have I haven't set it up to be multi instance. I don't even have a user ID in the database. Like it's just like designed to be a single user app. Yeah. So the question is about like data growth over time. Um, 
there's a lot of data sets that are just like streaming thousands and thousands. Like I have, I think it's minute granularity on Fitbit data, so like that's, that's a, like thousands per day. Um, also like my GPS trails are a thousand, I think, yeah, thousands per day. So there's a lot of like that kind of um, statistical data that's being generated. Um, but yeah, overall, I, would, I think it's about tens of thousands of data points per day are being added. Like browser history will always be, you know, low thousands. Um, the photos I take will be, you know, maybe 50 a day. So yeah, like it's, yeah, tens of thousands a day. Yeah, so the question is, like, I showed my bash history. Obviously, that could be a really bad idea. Um, so the question is, like, do I remove keys or things that I use? Um, I've generally, I think it's, like, forced a really good habit, which is, like, not putting keys in your command line history. Um, uh, like, I mean, there is kind of, like, a way for me to delete that if I accidentally put it in. Um, the other thing I was thinking about doing, I haven't implemented it yet, but I think I could build some sort of entropy checker, and if it's, like, a high entropy string, that could be a password, and I would just, like, maybe prompt the user or do something about that. But yeah, like, in general, I think, I think because it is a single user app with like an audience of one, like myself, um, like I'm a little bit more, um, I'm a little bit more tolerant of uh, putting like uh, secret data. Like I have all my text messages which are full of gossip and like, you know, like, like there's a lot of stuff that is very personal that I kind of trust in the system um, and I know that I could delete it if I have to. But yeah, like I think, I think something like a password uh, is, something, is, like a, is a use case that I probably should specifically try to address uh, with maybe an entropy checker or some, some sort of watch. Yeah, because that's pretty dangerous. Yeah, so the question is like, if I open source it, someone could come along and build a service that like um, aggregates information and mines it from users. Um, I mean, maybe, I, I, think, I think a lot of the reason, like I think the only reason someone would be comfortable installing this is if they could you know, look at the source and understand that, like, that it's like me who's not a bad person and uh, there's the kind of a open source community around it and it's not being centrally hosted. I think if someone asks you to sign up for a centrally hosted version of this, like I think most people would rightfully not want to do it, like it's, it's just a stupid idea, I think. So, I mean, that's my hope. I, my hope is that users will be smart enough to, not to sign up to some, any, any old person who wants to centrally host this version, but I guess that's not really a good enough answer, but I don't know, that, I guess that's the reality of the internet system we've created, so, yeah. How often do I import the data? Yeah, okay, so the question is, yeah, how often do I import? Um, Generally, things are running uh, every few minutes, if I can, because I really want accurate timestamps. So, um, but some things like have um, good timestamps in the history, in the actual endpoint itself, so I don't have to run it that uh, that frequently. Um, but yeah, like the, the importers are constantly running. Like even even while I've been standing here, like it's you know my my system now has the records of me presenting in it. Um, so generally, things are like always flowing in. Um, yeah, and it's it's like all just bash, uh, just like Ruby scripts running on cron. I don't think I see any other hands. So thanks for listening. Uh, again, if you're interested in, uh, if you're interested in using this or trying it or have ideas or horrors about this, uh, I'd love to talk. And you can sign up uh, if you're interested. Thanks a lot for listening.